Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are back again with another Soul Seeker podcast. I am here with Dr. Craig Heacock, which I'm excited to speak with Dr. Craig for so many reasons, and one of which is my brother's name is Craig, and you don't meet many Craigs often. No. But before we dive into this, let's go ahead and just uh, ground ourselves with some breath. So if you're listening and you are driving, please, please, please don't close your eyes. But whatever you're doing, you can always breathe with us. So if you're in a place that you can start to slow down and close your eyes, We'll just go ahead and begin to find some stillness, sitting up straight, noticing the feet on the floor, palms on the lap, and through the nose, inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding, and through the mouth, exhaling, bringing the belly to the spine, dropping the shoulders, through the nose, inhaling up as we let the belly expand and bringing that breath all the way up to the chest. Sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath here. And sighing it out, letting it go, let it out, let it out. And one last one, inhaling slowly all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Sipping a bit more, maybe applying a root lock and just holding the breath here, allowing ourselves to feel and slowly releasing, exhaling, letting it go, letting it go, let it out. Find the breath return to the natural state and rhythm, flickering the eyes back open. Sweet. All right. Here we are. Dr. Craig, in a word or two, how are you feeling in this moment? Much better. Thank you. <laughs> That's all it that takes. Was a, that was a really nice way to start. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. I, I appreciate, too, the opportunity to just drop in. I think any meeting, you know, or just getting in frequency resonance with one another really helps because we have so many different things going on through who knows what happened before and blah, blah, blah. Anyways, so now we're here. You and I are together. Listeners, you're with us. So Craig, you go by Craig, right? Yep. Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, sweet. I would love to hear your story because I've listened to a few of your podcasts, which is Back from the Abyss, if you guys want to check it out. It's a top half percent podcast, which is amazing. Congrats on that. And shout out to Peter Larney for introducing us. So I'm, I'm a little familiar with your work, but for someone that's just coming across your work or yourself for the first time. Can you give us a little bit of an introduction to who you are and your background? Yes. Um, I'm an adolescent and adult psychiatrist and addiction specialist, and I'm on my third career. I was a high school teacher for a few years, and then I got a master's and did environmental work. So career number three, but I think this is it. I think I'm going to ride this till the end. I have a longstanding interest in psychedelics, um, that was actually an interest of mine to, that brought me into psychiatry. 
25 years ago. Um, and at that point in the late nineties, not much was happening, but a lot is happening now. We can explore that possibly, uh, on my podcast, which is actually a big love and passion project project of mine right now. I'm really interested in storytelling. So back from the abyss is a psychiatric storytelling podcast. So it's where it's a place where people can describe their, their journey, their plunge into the kind of darkest realms of the psyche and how they got out. It's kind of like the moth meets uh, psychiatry. And I started that five years ago and that has become a real central focus of my life. I mean, I still have a full private practice uh, and the, the podcast is just a, you know, for nonprofit passion project. Another thing I've gotten interested in recently is I work with a, uh, a number of psychiatric nurse practitioners all over the country as a mentor and coach. And I realized that there's a great need among the psych psychiatric nurse practitioner community to learn more therapy. So I've just started um, putting together kind of a, a psychiatric psychotherapy boot camp for psychiatric nurse practitioners. So I'm doing my first one this fall. So having 20 psych and peace from all over the country fly in and, and kind of focus on all the things I think that are critical for doing the basic psychological grunt work with patients in, in the psychiatric trenches. So that's a, another project I'm excited about. Yeah, the boot camp sounds really fascinating. So is that something where you're giving out certifications or like what can you unpack that a little bit more? Because I know since, right, I'm a coach, right? Right. So I don't really have like scientific, uh, I'm see, I can't even say it right. I'm like scientific certifications for this stuff, whether uh, I mean, sure, breath work certifications and yoga certifications and things like that. But if you're a psychiatrist that's training other psychiatrists, like how does that work? Yeah. So this is actually going to be mostly psychiatric nurse practitioners who are nurses who then did advanced nurse practitioner training. So they'll be able to get continuing education credits, but not any specific certification beyond that. I think these are all people who found me through Back from the Abyss. And you know, Back from the Abyss, among other things, is a celebration of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. I love psychotherapy. I'm deeply saddened that so many psychiatrists and psychiatric and nurse practitioners are not doing therapy, or at least they they think they're not. Um, they're doing it kind of mindlessly and incompetently. But I, one of my many goals is to try to bring therapy back into psychiatry. So yeah, so people won't leave with a specific certification like IFS or EMDR or something, but we're really looking at like what's happening moment to moment in the psychotherapeutic moment. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, there's everything unfolds moment by moment. And so one of the hardest things about sitting with someone in the therapeutic container is what do you do and say in each unfolding moment? And there's actually some very kind of interesting algorithms that can guide you that I think beginning therapists or even a lot of advanced therapists haven't thought a lot about. So we're going to dive into that. Yeah. You said right now you want to guide us in one of those, you call it an algorithm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how much more you want to hear about. Yeah, this. I, I, this is really fascinating to me. Oh, yeah, okay. It will be for a lot of people. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. so, so one way to, to think about sort of chatting versus therapy versus talk therapy Therapy needs heat. And in the heat is, is I think it almost like a flame under the patient or client. It's, it's arousal, it's anxiety, it's tension, it's anger, it's fear, it's shame. You know, if you, you need some kind of heat to get things cooking. So one of the ways to think about being a therapist is in each moment, first of all, I'm, or, or the beginning therapist might be thinking, is there any heat on? You know, so if someone's sitting down like, oh, I just got back from Las Vegas and I went gambling and I bought a dog and now I'm going to sell my Subaru. So that's talking. But, you know, therapy doesn't start until the heat gets turned on. And the heat, you know, could be one of a million things. It might be the therapist saying, hey, I wonder if you're ready today to dive back into some of that mom stuff that we talked about last time. You know, and the, all of a sudden, you've just like lit the flame and maybe the patient's like, okay, or maybe not. Maybe like they want to keep chit chatting, so the you know the first maneuver in the moment is to light the flame, uh, and then once you get the flame going, there's really only three things you can do once once the patient the, the client's starting to cook. Once there's some anxiety, there's some arousal, there's some tension, that you can stay in it. That's called holding, and that's what ther most therapists know. It's kind of the ultimate mom stance. It's 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 a position of sort of unconditional regard. Uh, 
quiet, peaceful curiosity, non-judgment, love, um, compassion, gentleness, grace. And that's called holding. And again, when a lot of people think of psychotherapy, they think of that. Like they think, oh, my therapist is going to hold me, which is, which is a really crucial stance. Like being with it versus fixing it. Yeah, yeah. But then, right. But then the other maneuver is I, I call it divert. So you can hold, which is you can stay in the flame and you can stay in the shame, stay in the fear, stay in the sadness, stay in the anger and hang with it. And and really assume that like ultimate mom stance where almost like you're giving this huge psycho spiritual hug around them and like, oh my gosh, I feel so loved and held and understood. The second thing you can do is divert. And that's where you, you move them to something totally different. And um, there's a lot of reasons you might do that. But the most interesting place to go in therapy is, is where you go meta or where you go into what's called the here and now. And that, that is what differentiates, the, differentiates therapy from parenthood or you know, friendship or intimate love is, the, is when the therapist goes into the here and now. And that's where the therapist um, stops the storytelling, stops the um, moves out of the affect and says, Let's just for, for there's a million ones you could ways you could do this. Could be like, could we just review what just happened right now? You came in and you stared at the clock and you started to cry. And I noticed that seven and a half minutes went by and you stared at the clock and cried and I saw your body shaking. And I wanted to say something, but da da da. And so it so you're going to this like meta critique. Or it could be um, you know, uh, if I could just stop you for a sec and get to go meta. I, I hear you talking. I've heard what you've said the last four or five minutes, but I feel like what's most important is what's not been said. I feel like there, there are things, and I worry, for example, that when you drive away from here in this, you're going to look back at what was missed right here and realize this was an incredibly important moment in our therapy. And so anyway, I could go on and on, but but mm -hmm. the, the here and now is where you you take therapy to a whole new level. It's not just holding or advice giving or affirmation. It's where you get to what's happening in the room between the therapist and the client patient. And why that's so important is because why do people come to therapy? People come to therapy largely, especially depth therapy, long-term therapy, because they have deep psychological wounds. They've been deeply wounded by dad, by mom, by someone really important to them. And, you know, the, the joke is people come to you know therapy for mommy wounds or daddy wounds, but that's true. I mean, that, you don't see many people coming to long-term therapy who grew up in healthy, loving, stable, compassionate, healthy families. Like th those people might you know step their toe in therapy, but they're out. But again, but what you do in the here and now is what you start to examine the deep psychological wounds that our patients have that are holding. They are going to bring those into the therapy relationship through this process of transference. And when you move meta, you, you're you actually pointing out to the patient client that whatever most ails them, like they don't need to come in and tell you stories about it. This is what my mom did. This is what my dad did. This is what my boss did. This is what it's playing out in the room. And so you can, the two of you can do this relentless working through whatever it is. Because guess what? If a patient has abandonment issues, that those are going to play out in the therapy relationship. And so if you're just holding it, you know, the patient's like, oh, dad left me and my husband left me and my new boyfriend left me, you know, hold that, hold that, hold that. And that's all well and good. And, and you know, there's some value in that, but where the real money is where you go meta. And um, something like, I wonder when I've abandoned you. Or even I wonder in the space between us, if there's any part of you that feels right now that, Either I've already abandoned you, or I'm gonna abandon you. Mm. Uh, what will it take? You know, when when the inevitable the inevitable abandonment comes, like what will that look like? I wonder if we could play that out right now. So, I call the here and now the magic space, you know, the meta space. Uh, and so, the training I'm doing this fall is gonna focus heavily on that. Uh, on day one, how do you know in the clinical mo moment whether to hold, whether to divert, or most importantly, I would argue to move it to go meta into the here and now. I love that so much. And there's so many different uh, paths that I want to go down there. And we'll see if eventually we can get to them all. And one of them being is, for lack of a better way of saying it, kind of like the bridging of spiritual circles to traditional therapy uh, approaches. Because for me, I never felt
like I personally was getting a lot out of therapy. I never did like quote unquote long-term therapy, but when I did, it was just like, this isn't really helpful. I'm just kind of talking about things and it's not really alive in me. I didn't have the language back then to say it wasn't alive in me, but now I do being like, now if I need to schedule a session with my therapist, by the time I actually get to that session, hopefully I've already had, I do now have the tools to handle it. So by me talking about it, I'm reliving it and replaying that story. And I love what you're talking about awareness just this morning. I was working with a client where it very similar. It was a story. It was a story, a story. And I forget what I said it was one of those things that just kind of came through, but like how we can allow the season of the story that we're in to be the narrative. And then that blocks us from actually receiving love, joy, abundance, because we're in this frequency of, oh no, I'm, I'm trapped in this story based off, off of a larger season, right? So there's a lot there for sure and we will get into the kind of like the bridging of spirituality and science and your work with psychedelics and all of that but before we do just to kind of like step backwards because there's psyche there's psychedelics there's a psychiatrist there's psychotherapy like in your own words like could you explain what the origin of the word psyche means and how it relates to the field that you're in psychedelics and just kind of like a broad stroke a brush uh take it where you want to take it <laughs> that's such an interesting question <laughs> you know i think even for me that's evolved so much um because i think when i when i started my psychiatric training i would have thought of psyche much more in a psychological term our psychological terms, um, you know, our thoughts and our feelings and our ego and our super ego. But I think more and more working in this field, I, I really see the psyche as including, um, well, I think for the best, the best way I can describe it is, is chi or energy. I did, um, before, probably 10, 12 years ago, I did some acupuncture training and um kind of dove into this idea of chi and ever since then often when people come in and i look at them i kind of do a little chi assessment and i actually think of that as part of their psyche you know there's the mm -hmm. psyche where people talking about you know how they're thinking and feeling and, and their self-conception and how they experience the world but there's also like their spark like their energy i'm looking like you know it, when people's psyche is damaged they're almost like a tree with with wilted um, wilting leaves or broken branches. Like they have this look to them. You know, it's interesting when people get better in, in psychiatry, they, they look better. They are you. And it's not just like they're, they look more, more tan or healthy or they're wearing nicer clothes. They're actually, I think it's like their psyche comes out of them in this sort of uh, energetic, like a spiritual way. And they, they have more, a hundred percent and this plays into psychedelics too like yeah. i i recently i was looking at some pictures of myself uh but over five years ago before i was on the path of like working with medicines and all of these things completely different looking person and this is very common with psychedelic therapy plant and earth medicine ceremonies ceremonies include especially you know mm -hmm. i agree um, yeah so I really, I, and this is interesting, one of the reasons, and I've talked about this in my podcast a lot, one of the reasons I struggle so much with telehealth, with telemedicine, I didn't realize I did till COVID when I had to do a lot of it, is I feel like if I'm not in someone's presence, I can't feel their energy. I can't assess their energy. I can't really get a good chi reading. And so I can assess their, if you will, their psyche or their psychological health based on what they're saying and their speech patterns and their movements and their eye contact and insight. And, but I feel like I'm missing a huge energy piece, which is when someone comes in my office, I, I can tell how they're doing, especially if I've known them for very long. Like I, I don't even really need to ask, you know, and they, I could just feel you can, I can see it. I can feel it. And um, what is that? <laughs> I don't know, but I, you know, I'm re reminded when I did my acupuncture training, the guy was describing what's chi. He said, you know what chi is? He said, you ever been with a, like a dog or beloved cat or, or a family member when they die? He said, 
and you know the difference between your beloved pet and, and your family member and a cadaver? It's like, that's chi. It's like, mm. as soon as you could go, as soon as you die, your chi is gone, that animating energy force. And that was so eye opening to me because I have been with a number of creatures and people and when they died and something fundamentally changes when they die. And I, you can see that in profoundly depressed people. It's almost like if there's a chi energetic continuum, when people come in, you know, I've had people come in in my office, like, you know, I already feel dead or uh, I haven't killed myself, but I'm ready to. And you, so you can look at them and you can be like, wow, you are barely flickering. Like there's just this sort of dulled, muted, you know, totally drained battery energy about you. That... For me, I call that feeling numb. That's what it feels like for me when mm -hmm. I'm in like a numbing depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, kind of yeah, I know we got a little off, off topic with, or off track with psyche, but I, I really think that is kind of like an outer manifestation of the psyche, if you will, or maybe it's just so intricately tied to it. It's hard to separate it. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting. I kind of think of the psyche as like the higher self, the soul, and then the ego as being like the identification of who we are in this current incarnation. You mentioned the term super ego. What what is what is the super ego? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, that's an evolving concept too for me. Um I'm familiar I think with I'm, the super conscious, yeah, like the I, canon. I, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I've moved away from kind of that Freudian idea of the super ego for me, more for this kind mm -hmm. of I idea of like a union collective unconscious that, you know, it seems pretty clear to me that if you've experienced, if you've done deep work, deep work with ketamine or with psilocybin or a number of these substances, like what's going on can't all just be in your, in your head, in your unconscious. Like that can't just be funky circuitry deep in your cortex. Like there, there's something you're tapping into some greater thing um is that super ego is that collective unconscious is that i mean i don't know but it, it's there's something bigger and vaster than us and like we're these little temporal blips in that so it sounds like super ego is similar to like the collective unconscious then well no i think they're different concepts psychoanalytically oh. but uh yeah i think it's the super ego is more hi hierarchical and sort of uh sort of value shame sh should base this is you know kind of the the moral principles that are guiding the ego but uh, yeah i don't that's not a helpful construction for me anymore i'm much more yeah this is still so, this is all really evolving i if we had talked about this 18 months ago i would have something different to say this is, but I'm, would you say this is evolving uh, as a because of your work with psychedelics? And if so, what, what is that unfolding looking like? I think it is, it is a lot of it's unfolding because of the podcast, because, you know, you have a podcast, you know, one of the things, it's fun things about having a podcast is you get to drive the bus. So you get to decide what am I interested in? Who do I want to talk to? So whatever is really interesting me or scratching my itch, I, I find someone to talk to about that. Yeah. So I've met all these amazing people the last few years who've turned me onto ideas I just had never even thought about. Um, so in, in some ways, like back from the abyss, it's sort of, it's not just my passion project, but it's like, hmm, what's super interesting to me and what do I want to learn about? Um, so so there's I'm often talking to people who I, I just think I had never thought of that before. You know, okay, and... so let's go back to Psyche because we definitely uh, were on a little bit of a rabbit hole yeah. there. So if you could describe what the Psyche is in like a sentence or two, how would you summarize it? I would say it is the it is the lenses it is made up of the lenses through which we perceive and understand the world and how those then are cataloged into the memories and connections that help us make sense of the world and and, and put together a story of the world 
Okay. Yeah. That, and that I, makes I was sense. just totally winging that. <laughs> no, <laughs> for sure. That <laughs> you could tell from the long pause. I yeah. No, not. I appreciate you, uh, you taking your time in that. I actually Googled the origin meaning of the word psychedelic before this, cause I was a little curious and I really don't like how the uh, Google has the AI preview right now. Now, and there's like studies coming out too, specifically with chat GPT, how like chat GPT will give you the raw, like I, I'm kind of anti-AI, I'll, I do use it, but not a lot. So one of the things that came up though, outside of that Wikipedia, not much better. It says that psychedelics, the Greek word of psyche, soul or mind, and then the Delian, which I guess is tied to the Delic is to manifest. So what's interesting to me when we take psyche and look at psychedelics soul and then the delic part like to manifest and i'm not sure exactly how to interpret that but is that something you've looked at or you, anything coming through for you in terms of taking psyche and comparing it to psychedelics well um you know it's it's it for me, it's, it was really interesting in my brief forays into meditation. Like I, I did Sam Harris's um, in meditation, fifty session course. And uh, you know what I what I found is what Sam was hoping is that when you get when you go all all the way in and you realize there's no observer, there's only observing. There's no seer. There's only seeing. That and I think you know you can get that. It's also with ketamine. You get to this place where you realize like. There is no self. There's it that all dissolves when you go inward. There's there, there's there's seeing, there's observing, there's there's awareness, but it's just like that seems to be the base state. And then the psyche, or you know, yeah, the psyche kind of hangs on that with the different, you know, as as the pure sensory input comes in, we have all these different lenses that are a lot of those I think you know are from our early childhood relationships or you know and some of those are and those and I think that those lenses are made of kind of the genetic material that that determines our temperament but but we're um everything that's coming in is being put through these lenses and altered and, and again put in this kind of library of how do we understand what's coming into the mind, but, but yet at the core, there is no I, no self, which is, is a really strange thought. But I mean, when I, when Sam used to talk about that before I did his meditation course, I, I didn't even understand what he meant. Now I fully know what he means. So, um, but here's something I am going to do after our recording today, I'm going to read a little bit more on the psyche and see what other people have to say. <laughs> yeah, and well, it's not like there's a right or wrong answer. I mean, the thing about all of these, I was going to use the word framework, but that is not the right word for a, like being a psychiatrist, right? But like studies is we, we come to an agreement of like, hey, this is whatever it is. And some people are going to be mad at me right now and think I'm a kook. But like, look at Charles Darwin and evolution, right? And then you watch a show like with Greg Braden, uh, Missing Links, or just different things and be like, well, because we've always thought that was the case for was it been two 300 years i'm not sure off the top of my head you know that's always going to be the case i think we should be open to hey we're evolving and let's get curious versus just like this is the way the the differentiator here is something that went viral with um i think his name is terrence howard uh he was on uh joe rogan and what did you know what i'm talking about did you I, hear see that? Vaguely, yeah, this sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like one times one or two times two isn't like what it actually is. And he was trying to explain it. And I was sitting there listening to it and I was like, man, he is really smart. And then I was having these conversations in my head. Do I think he's really smart just because I have no idea what he's talking about? And he says he, these patents and he's saying it with confidence. And I'm like, am I the one that's being a, you know, silly here? But the, the point of what I'm saying is 
I think it's it's worth staying open and curious and really feeling into our own intuition. And that seems to be a lot of the work that you're doing. You know, when you talk about working with your patients with your algorithmic approach so that you can first hold space for them and reflect back to them, really what you're doing there is guiding them to get in touch with their own intuition so that they can find the answers for themselves. And I really appreciate hearing you say in one of your podcasts about how it's been a, and I'm paraphrasing, but how it's been an evolution for you to learn to trust your patients as the inner healer. I would love mm -hmm. to hear like from your formal training of being a psychiatrist to now working with ketamine, MDMA, and so many other therapies, how that transition is going and be like, oh, maybe I don't necessarily need to diagnose them and I can guide them to find that answer for themselves. Mm -hmm. You have a lot to say on that. One thing that just popped in my mind, um, this is a fascinating phenomenon that I've asked other docs and therapists about. And they said, oh yeah, this happens to them too. I've had patients come back to me frequently and say, I just want to thank you for saying X. And they quote me. And 99 times out of 100, it's something I would never have said. And they'll say, you know, that was so helpful and you changed things. And I didn't know what to make before. I was like, oh, people just don't remember very well or blah, blah, blah. But now I realize, I think this is an inner healer thing. I think, you know, we, and this kind of goes back to the psyche. We all are perceiving what's happening very differently. We're running it all through these lenses, through these transferential lenses. And, um, and we're, we, we're, none of us are experiencing things clearly, but clearly, I think what these patients are saying is you created, you, we co-created a space where I was open to you or to us so I could come up with a, a story or something to hang my hat on or something meaningful and I'm going to attribute it to you. It wasn't me. I think we, I think it's we, like we created a space of safety and, and love and understanding where they then, you know, could start to grow and, and fill the space that they hadn't filled before. You know, one of the things I've asked pretty much everyone has been on my podcast, like, why did, how, excuse me, how did you get better? How did you heal? And sometimes people can explain that, but very often they can't. And I would be, I was really frustrated the first couple of years. Like, why can't people really explain why they get better? And then I realized it's, I think it's a little bit like if we could talk to trees, like, how do you grow? Like, tell us in the tree, be like, I just, I take in carbon dioxide and, water and I make glucose and, pro, you know, proteins like, well, but wait, but how do you do that? And I, but I think it's what we do. Like we, we really are, our, our baseline healthy nature is to thrive and grow and, and just do our thing. So, so much what I, I think is happening in, in good therapy or good care is we're trying to clear away the barriers Again, I often think of people's like trees, like they come in and they're damaged. Like, gosh, what do we do to get this tree to grow? And I think the medical model is we're going to put the right chemicals on you, and yeah. we're going to do the right herbicide, and we're going to cut, 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 or, and you know, we're going to we're going to make you grow. And I think the reality is, uh, while the tree might need fertilizer, might need a little trimming, <clears throat> what it really needs is for us to remove the barriers so it can start to grow and do its tree thing. Which is another idea of the inner healer is that people you know, people have been getting traumatized for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. And most people do not get PTSD. You know, we, mm. we are the, we are the descendants of tens of thousands of genera generations of completely badass humans who've, who have lived through cholera and the black death and terrible childbirth and war and infection. And so we have the, the, the ability to survive unbelievable hardship. So, you know, it's, it's actually a really nice perspective to take the pressure off us as therapists or physicians, like, oh, I need to fix this person or change them. You know, it's, it's very different. Like I want to help them, us create the space where they can start to grow again. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think so much of that comes out of the therapeutic relationship, the trust, the holding, the love, which um, sadly is often lacking in the American psychiatric experience. Yeah, I love your analogy of the tree and plants. And I can say with 
hundred percent confidence. Like my first night specifically with ayahuasca five and a half years ago, almost like it, I could feel the presence of the plants, you know, it was, it was undeniable. And my dad recently, I uh, probably shouldn't say on his podcast, but it's all good. Uh, he recently said, um, you know, just working with THC cannabis, uh, talking with the plants and he's got a big green thumb and whatnot. I'm like, of course, like, it's just a little bit of weed for you and you're doing it. Like, I mean, I can't, that doesn't work for me with cannabis. <laughs> that said though, what your, the analogy I love, there was uh, something else I wanted to touch on, but it is escaping me now, unfortunately. Gently. Um, another thing, because things just keep popping up, was uh, it's interesting to see like what's becoming legal and acceptable. And you feel free to pass on any of these questions if they feel uh, not good to speak on publicly. But traditionally we're seeing like psychiatrists or more acceptable psychedelics be something that's made in a lab such as like mdma or ketamine and mushrooms is coming online as well now for me like there's see i i don't work with as much of something that's made in a lab uh, but when i do it seems to be lacking that soul or mm -hmm. there's it's a little bit more it's just a different frequency. Why do you think it is that like in order to legalize something, it needs to be made in a lab and we can't, we can't just look at the plants and be like, oh, but that is a plant that seems like whole and complete and natural, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. At least the way that say the FDA is set up now, the Food and Drug Administration is never going to approve mushrooms, you know, or a plant. Like it would be some extract from a plant, extract from a fungus, extract from a bark because they want to break it down to what's the one chemical or the two chemicals. Which one's the bark? Is that chaga or chaga? Oh, I was just, I was thinking of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. But, but you know, the, surely uh, there, there are many, many things that we could consume from nature in their natural form, which would be more helpful than just breaking it down to their constituent one or two or three most active molecules. Mm -hmm. So again, that, that's such a... a in a lot of ways, it's such a, a Western. Uh, it's a God medical, complex, isn't medical, it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's almost like breeding dogs. It's like <laughs> it's uh, the human God complex is what it seems like to me. Like, oh no, that's not good enough. We have to go tinker with it. Yeah, yeah. What's well, kind of like what's happened with with cannabis? You know, across the country in Colorado, more and more, like nobody's smoking flour. They're like, why would you do that? Soaks. They're just going right to THC concentrates, and they're or or if they are smoking flour, it's incredibly potent sativas that they've you know like dogs they've bred 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 have these crazy amounts of THC in them, and you know we're seeing uh, I've talked about this a lot in the podcast we're seeing all these crazy awful psychiatric uh, problems with these um, cannabis varieties that never existed in nature that were you know just been uh, artificially selected to try to make the most mind altering thing possible and. You know, whereas we didn't used to ever really see psychotic breaks or manic breaks with cannabis the way it used to be, but now right. that's that's not an uncommon thing because right, what's being sold in stores is so far from what grew in nature. Okay, so I, I how are you on time? By the way, I, I'm I good. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, maybe another thirty minutes or sure. a little yeah. bit longer. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. So. Rules for medicines. You brought up um, uh, manic and like psychosis, things like that. And this is uh, this is a very fascinating thing in terms of someone that's wanting to do the work, but maybe they've been di actually. First, let's start here. Diagnosis is um, mm -hmm. how does one actually get a diagnosis? Like what what is that process? Because to me, it seems very subjective, which makes it a, kind of a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. So, so psychiatry has a huge nosology problem, which nosology is the way we come up with our diagnoses. So okay. the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry, I don't know, has hundreds of diagnoses in it. Uh, I did a podcast about a year and a half ago with Will Vanderveer, who's an integrative psychiatrist here in Colorado. He and I both suggested that there probably should be about six or seven diagnoses. And I actually agree. There might maybe eight the rest of them are total bullshit. Um, so, so that's hard too, because there are a small number of psychiatric diagnoses, which there is abundant evidence, genetic evidence, epidemiological evidence, 
pharmacological evidence, anatomical evidence that they exist. So one would be what we call bipolar one or what used to be called manic depression. That is definitely a thing. Like that is a diagnosis. It's a discrete diagnostic diagnostic entity. It has its own genetics. It has its own specific medication response. I mean, there are many, many features of it that track very predictably. You know, so let's on what exactly would that be if for someone that because I've recently did a podcast on this mm -hmm. and it, I was learning and I'm still learning. And I think a lot of people it's going to be helpful to hear exactly what uh, bipolar one is. Mm -hmm. So again, bipolar one used to be called manic depression, um, which is arguably a much better description. So manic depression is characterized by episodes of depression and most people know what that is mm -hmm. but it's also characterized by episodes of mania uh, almost always with what we call psychotic features psychotic symptoms typically delusions of grandeur or um, paranoia um, um, ability to read people's minds or thinking people can read your minds which is kind of a form of paranoia mm -hmm. and um, those folks that is a um, very genetic kind of diagnosis that runs in families. Interestingly, it often skips generations. So if grandma had manic depression, oftentimes the grandkids are much more at risk of it than the, the, than the um, first order kids of those uh, mm -hmm. the bipolar one person. It has a uniquely um, very positive, strong response to lithium. Um, it uh, is notoriously hard to treat the depressive episodes, like all the standard quote unquote antidepressants and that we've had in psychiatry just typically don't work for, well for the depression of bipolar one. Um, and uh, typically people have two or three, say major episodes of depression in their teenage years and they have their first manic psychotic episode in the late teens, early twenties. So that, that's kind of the general gist of it. Um, it, uh, it, Again, but what I think is important about it, it is, I think most all psychiatrists would agree, like it is, it is a very discreet, recognizable, if you will, kind of true diagnosis. And when we see it, we're like, okay, that is a thing. Mm -hmm. Like that is absolutely, you know, in the new, in Craig's new DSM, like there would be a little chapter on bipolar one. Um, so if you're meeting with a new patient that mm -hmm. has not been diagnosed with bipolar one or manic depression, as it was mm -hmm. formerly known, which sounds much better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I agree with that. What would be kind of your process to walk th them through to make an educate formal decision if they mm -hmm. have bipolar one or not? Yeah. I used to work uh, with a colleague who said, I love this. He said, family collateral is the imaging of psychiatry. And what he meant by that is, you know, in most in most specialties of medicine, you can get a CAT scan or ultrasound, you get cool imaging, like, ooh, right, you have a cyst, yeah. you know. But psychiatry, we don't, we don't really use imaging. But what he argued, which I totally agree, is that family collateral information. And by what we mean by that is um, psychiatric illness is longitudinal. It often develops slowly and insidiously over time. People for a lot of interesting reasons, often are not good reporters of their past psychiatric history. So for that reason, we often get some of our most valuable, especially our diagnostic information from family members. So, mm -hmm. you know, in my practice, I will not treat anyone. I mean, maybe someone who has very mild symptoms. I don't really see those people. I mean, people who come to me are, are really desperately hurting. I won't treat anybody that doesn't let me talk to their family. Uh, and I, you know, I tell them like, I'm not going to share any information about you, but you know, I need to talk to your mom or your dad or your wife or somebody. Cause I need to get collateral because inevitably when we don't get collateral, that's where we get burned. And what okay. sorts of questions are you asking the family members? Yeah. So, so let's just talk about mania. There's some really fascinating research that's come out. That's that conclusively shows that people who have had manic episodes either don't really remember them at all. Or if they remember them, they remember them at time is when they felt good. So, so this is like this happens all the time. Like I could be um, talking to a new patient, and let's say um, they've had some pretty severe de uh, uh, depressive episodes, and so I'm thinking, well, is this a bipolar thing? So I might say, oh, did you ever have a time where you 
were the opposite of depressed. You had lots of energy. Your sex drive was high. You were creative and, and not needing much sleep and you know, maybe making some risky decisions and driving too fast or spending money. And it's very common to hear, you know, the, say the spouse say, mm, no, you know, and the wife's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> what about two years ago when you took the 401k and you went to Mexico city with all the hookers? What about five years ago when I had to bail you out of jail, when you were driving down I-25, 120 miles an hour, you know, blah, 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 you know, and then the patient will be really do you think I was manic then? And the spouse like, well, what else was, the, you know? So it's interesting. So it's not a lying thing. Um, or the other thing that sometimes what people say, when, say when their family member confronts them about man mania, they'll say, well, maybe, but I don't really remember it that way. But, you know, if you think about sleep, you know, one of the purposes of sleep is to consolidate memories and to lay down memories. So when people are manic, they're not sleeping. They're just, you know, if they're sleeping, it's like an hour or two a night. So, it's almost like they're a meth. They're just on full bore go for days to weeks, months. So they're probably, there's, there's good reasons why they're not laying down any memories. So, you know, you ask them five, 10 years later in your office, like, have you had these manic symptoms? The vast majority of people say, no, I haven't. So again, family collateral crucial. And, you know, I think that's true. Well, even like episodes of depression, like we fortunately, I think there's a lot of good evol evolutionary reasons why we don't remember how bad certain things can be. And so, mm. but again, people often don't remember how severe their depressive episodes were. And you bring in the father or the sister and they're like, wait, Hey, are you kidding me? Like, that's when you bought the gun. That's when I had to come over and take the gun out of your hands. And the person like, Oh, Oh, you're right. Yeah. Hmm. I guess it was bad. Like, yeah, it was bad. So those me taking manic out of the equation here, but those memories that we don't remember um, that were like unconsciously or subconsciously, which is basically the same thing to my mm -hmm. understanding, uh, forgetting or not remembering, that would be suppressing and repressing is intentionally and consciously blocking those memories. Is that right? Well, I think a lot of repression is unconscious. Oh, it's so the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, good example, like a lot of kids who grow up with um, terrible abuse um, learn, if you will, to to repress those memories, either through kind of the process of dissociation or to just, you know, some, some people say, I just consciously told myself, like, I'm not going to remember it like this. I'm going to, it has to be some other way. So there's different ways you can change memories. But um, I think... For a, again, there's a lot of good reasons why humans are pretty competent at both consciously and unconsciously tinkering with our memories. Okay, cool. Thank you for that because I was wondering. Uh, so I'd love to go over the top eight or however many we can get through of the diagnoses. What What do you think would make more sense to do each one and look at them in terms of like how they might be treatable with psychedelics or just look at them all as a whole? Um, I mean, I th kind of think those are, those are two very interesting and separate issues. Like what, but I could just kind of run through just sort of quick what I think some of these, uh, if you will, kind of more, do you, do you know the word parsimonious? Parsimonious is when you, you come up with this sort of the one explanation that ties things together the most, most fully. Cool. So, yeah. Um, so, so there's bipolar one. Then there is this huge area that the DSM has no idea, calls it bipolar two, bipolar not otherwise specified, recurrent depressive disorder, endogenous depression. There's probably like literally like 29 diagnoses. But what they're getting at is there is a whole large crew of people who don't have the full blown manic depression, but they have some of that genetic loading. So, what does that look like? They um, they have depression with hypersomnia. So if you, if you, if you look in, in, let me back up a little bit, the core diagnosis of psychiatry, kind of like our peanut butter and jelly diagnosis, our most common diagnosis is major depressive disorder. If you look up the criteria for that, one of the criteria is you can either have insomnia or hypersomnia. So you can either not be sleeping or sleeping too much, mm -hmm. which is insane. It would be like saying, you know, you have um, skin disorder, skin disorder characterized by rash or no rash. Like, wait, 
major depressive disorder, you're either sleeping a lot or not sleeping because those are very different things. You know, hypersomnia is a shutdown of the nervous system. Insomnia is a over arousal. So even our most core diagnosis in psychiatry is completely suspect. And anybody who's given that much thought realizes it's really a wastebasket, meaningless diagnosis that almost surely doesn't have any grounding in reality. So, so to back up a, a little bit where I was just talking about, so the, the depressive state of manic depression is characterized by hypersomnia, oversleeping, Ma mania, no sleeping, um, depressed phase of bipolar one, oversleeping. Hmm. Well, so then, but the, again, but then there's a whole crew of people who have almost surely some of the genetic loading for bipolar one, but not enough that they get fully manic or psychotic, but they have the hypersomnia. The, the oversleeping, they have the seasonal worsening, which is a classic bipolar thing, getting worse in the fall, winter. That's for both? Yeah, right. They, that's for um, any of this kind of, if you call, if you will, bipolar spectrum depression. So, so the, I think category two in, in my DSM would be, so you got manic depression. Category two would be um, non-bipolar one endogenous depression which is basically this huge group of people that are characterized by seasonal worsening, um, frequent lifetime episodes, hypersomnia, deep fatigue and lethargy, interpersonal sensitivity. I, I also like to call this black bear depression. These are the people who want to hibernate. They you like to go, call it what? Black I call bear? it black bear depression, oh, like, black a, bear. like a hibernating yeah. black bear. Yeah, I use, it, use that with my patients. They're like, what, what kind of, what's my diagnosis? And I'll say, you have black bear depression. Mm -hmm. um, because again, it's so it's so much more helpful to speak with people in metaphors. I think, or you know, or these rather than to say like, "Oh, you are you know bipolar NOS blah blah blah." You know, because what do these even mean? You know, so we've we've tried to divide up all these states when when really there there's a kind of depression that's very inherited that has hypersomnia and um, is kind of in the bipolar flavor. And you know, a small percentage of those people have bipolar one, and a much bigger percentage of people have what. We, we, some of us in psychiatry call bipolar spectrum depression, or I call black bear depression, or you could call, you know, hypersomnic, uh, endogenous kind of genetic depression. So, okay. I, I have a couple questions here and thank you. This is uh, really insightful and helps me personally. I love it. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So black bear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, but, uh, all right. What percentage, just like roughly, roughly, I'm not, no one's going to hold you to this, but of the population, we could call it American population or world, whatever, um, whichever feels better to you, would you say has a bipolar one versus uh, the percentage of the population that might have bipolar two, like just rough yeah. percentages? Yeah, I believe bipolar one is, I just looked this up a couple of months ago. I think it's, like 1.6 or wow, that's 1, low. 1.2 or okay, yeah, it's low. Yeah, the kind of what we call that, what I call the big three, like the three really, if you will, kind of serious psychiatric diagnoses: schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and bipolar one. You add those all up, and they're like 3.6 percent or something, 3.3 okay. percent. And then yeah. what about uh, black bear? <laughs> yeah, so I would say that is uh, that's a big percentage of depressed people. So, you know, what's, you know, what's the lifetime incidence of, you know, what we call major depression in, in American adults, you know, it's, well, it's twice as high in women for a lot of interesting reasons, but um, yeah. So if you're thinking maybe like 10 or 15% of American men are going to have a major depressive episode in their, in their lifetime, what percentage of those are kind of the hypersomnic bipolar spectrum? I'm thinking probably uh, a third to a half of them. So we're looking like, at like five to 8%. Yeah, probably. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's not much higher. Like it is much higher in comparison to one, but it's not like, much. that's why words, right? And speaking mm -hmm. of subjectivity, because when I hear much higher, and thank you for answering that. I, I'm like, I don't know what that means. So yeah. that's really helpful. Another question I have is with um, bipolar two versus bipolar one, would you say bipolar two has like the delusions of grandeur and the, the narcissistic type? Uh, no, it does not. No, if by definition, and I actually agree with DSM on this, that 
if you have any psychotic elements or features to your to your bipolar disorder, you are in the manic depression category. And again, so what's like psychotic features is believing things that are patently untrue. Got it. Um, the non manic depression, non bipolar one, by definition, and I think by consensus, doesn't have any psychotic features. It's Art. it's it's a it's a disorder of mood, libido, energy, thought content, thought speed, um, kind of life energy, sleep, like all the other dial. Now, would you say that because it's almost like opposites attract, but in the same like family, right? Because it's, hey, we got something in common here, but we're very opposite tracks. Would you say like bipolar one and two, like they, they might attract each other in some kind of way? Yeah, if that were true, I mean, I, I'm totally fascinated by attraction. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that we see in mental health and psychiatry is that you know, this is the whole idea of the repetition compulsion and that um, if you grew up with an alcoholic abusive father, you are at significant risk of marrying an alcoholic and or emotionally abusive person. Mm -hmm. You grew up with uh, a parent who abandons you, you are at very high risk of finding a, a mate who's going to abandon you. And that's this unconscious process where we we replay our traumas. We, we unconsciously find that person who's going to replay our trauma narrative with us. And again, one of the primary reasons people come to long-term depth psychotherapy is they want to stop doing that. Like, why do I keep picking the men who abandon me? Why do I keep hooking up with alcoholic women? Why can't I find a friend who doesn't backstab me? And you know, one of the painful realities people come to hopefully is like, oh, this is part me. Like, it's not conscious, like, but I'm unconsciously playing out these dynamics. So when the question with the bipolar two, bipolar one, you can imagine like if you grow up and those are both very genetic. So you grow up with a parent, let's say with bipolar disorder, that's going to cause major issues in the family. And it could very well be that you unconsciously are drawn to someone with a serious mood disorder because you grew up with that as home cooking, you know, unconsciously you meet that person and they're kind of wild chaos. And you're like, mm, I know you, I can fix you. <laughs> <laughs> I got your number. So it's a, there's a, you know, there's a good reason why wounded people hook up with wounded people. There's a good yeah. reason why you know, like ill people hook up with ill people. Cause it's like, I know you. And again, so often it's not on a conscious level. It's like, I, you are, you are home. I've come home and I'm your person. And the, the other piece of this that's very fascinating for me, at least, is when you use the example of like, say, if you uh, grew up with an alcoholic uh, abusive parent and then you find that partner and then there's the other side of that where you have someone who represents like safety or stability and then mm -hmm. it's like, oh, no, I this is out of my comfort zone. This is not the familiar. I now need to leave this. And that's mm -hmm. more subconscious sabotage behavior, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've had numerous patients. In fact, this happened earlier this week. This uh, patient of mine who keeps hooking up with really abusive, abandoning men. And I, and I joked, I was like, when are you going to be in with a nice guy? She said, I try, but it's just so boring. She's like, the <laughs> bad boys are so much more interesting. I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> So what do you do in a situation like that when you're holding space for that patient? Because it, to run through your algorithm, you uh, hold space and then you kind of do like some mirroring or reflecting type, like you start to ask some pointed questions to help. Get, I mean, she already knows the answer, right? So yeah. like what it, you can lead a horse to water, but right. 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 But, but I think again, what a good example of, so let's say these wounded women who seek out men who are going to re-wound them. You can bet that if I become important to my female patient at all, like if there's in any way I establish trust or connection, those transfer transferential lenses, those trauma dynamics are going to play out between us. I'm going to become the abandoner, the emotional abuser, the asshole, the um, the ignorer, the the and those can play out all sorts of ways you know, in in vivo by texting, by no showing, by um, angry letters or emails, but, you know, I point out to those people regularly in these deeply, for, for example, like a deeply wounded woman, like I'm, I am going to turn into your abuser you, and it was going to be an unconscious process. But what's cool is we're actually looking for that. That's called transference. 
And when that happens, I, could I have your permission to point it out and so we can work on it? Um, and so surprise, surprise, like my women who have major, or I say women, but you know, it could be anyone who has major abandonment stuff, like that's going to play out in the session. And it's infinitely more valuable for me to go meta, to go here and now, and rather than to say, oh, your mom, this, your dad, that, your boyfriend, that, to say, wait, what's happening right now between us? I th I'm feeling like in the space between us, like something has changed. Like I feel, I can feel you pulling away. I can feel like, you know, can you put words to that? You know, where's the trust level between us? Because three weeks ago, you said you were eight out of 10 trust with me. Where would you put it today? Hmm. Oh, it's dropped to a six. What What's changed between us? What would I have to do to bring it back up to an eight? What would you have to do? And so by relentlessly coming back to the here and now of the relationship, you actually can work on the core relationship thing and dynamic in a way that you can't with the stepdad who's gone or the mm -hmm. mom who's in Texas or the abusive uncle or the ex-husband or even the husband at home because he's not there. Yeah. 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 You know, even the best couples therapists will do things like, show me one of your fight, fight right now. Fight. Like, don't tell me about past fights. Don't like, oh, he did this, she did that, he slept with something. No, no, no. Fight right now. Like, have a fight. Show me your common fight. Or when they start to fight, the therapist's like, stop. Like, let's, in the here and now, like, let's drill down on what's happening right now. Because that's a hundred times more interesting. I'm reminded, Sam, when you said earlier in this talk, when you'd been to therapy and it wasn't alive, you didn't feel alive. And mm -hmm. one of, you know, the here and now makes you feel deeply alive because otherwise it can be like wah, 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 oh that's not what i meant i meant it wasn't alive in me what was uh what i initially scheduled the session for oh like, i see i got it, got it. Been okay. processed so okay. it's like now i'm showing up okay let me just try to fill up time or we can talk about things that have happened in the past but you, you know what mm -hmm. i mean okay got it yeah um that is awesome and i noticed that your wife is a couples and sex uh, therapist for anyone that's interested they can reach out to you to your website find her and when i hear couples therapy just for a little bit comedic relief i every single time i see the picture from old school you know such a such a classic scene there but that aside there is a uh, something that I did want to point out there, but oh, wait, 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 is it going to come to me? Yes. Okay. So you playing out that role for this person, is this something that uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, going back to the situation of you're working with a patient who says the bad boys are so much more fun than it, the, she can't be with the nice guys, not this specific person, but generalization of something similar, then you become that role for them so they can start to heal it do they project that onto you or you step it they project it onto you yeah fast? yeah so there's two ways like one is they're just going to unconsciously project it on or play it out with me like they're play going to um and this would be the bad boy you would become yeah, the bad boy to them yeah yeah you said uh, what was the word aggressor was that the word oh yeah did i say it? like abuser or neglector okay. or abandoner Whatever um, it'd be. Okay. Yeah. So, because when I'm getting to know someone and, and they've been deeply interpersonally wounded, I'm always deeply, I want to know how, like, what was it? Because surprise, surprise, if it was a, a mom wound, like a, let's say an abandonment wound, they are now extremely vulnerable to future abandonment wounds. And so then I know, okay, this is what I need to look for. And I can, I can tell them, you know, in our work together, we're going to work on a lot of things. But one thing I'm going to keep the temperature of is, I'm going to keep asking you about aban abandonment, where we are on that. And if I sense that we're there, I, I want to explore it. And, and it's very possible that you patient are going to do things. that are going to make me want to abandon you. So that's called projective identification. So, you know, and this mm. happens like the patient leaves a session and I think, Oh, how can I fire this person? How can I get rid of them? Oh my gosh, they're coming back next Tuesday. Shoot me. And then I, you know, if I'm being a good therapist, I ask myself like, Whoa, what is going on? Why am I just so wanting to not see the person? Oh, I wonder, I wonder if they're bringing this out of me. If we're playing out this unconscious dance that what they're, they're doing and saying unconsciously exactly what they need to do and say to make me loathe them, to make me want to cancel on them, to make me want to find a way to fire them. And that's where I can think, Oh, it's called projective identification. They're basically 
putting their stuff into me and turning me into the abandoning abuser. And uh, it's, I mean, it's hard to hold that. But again, yeah. if you work with really damaged people, like you have to be able to hold that because if you ignore it, like I'm just going to hold, you're just going to hold, hold, hold. Well, nothing's going to change because again, it's not getting to, the problem isn't just that they need to be held. The problem is that they need to recognize that they are 50% of this terrible trauma dynamic that they keep playing out and they need to be able to identify it in vivo and, and change it. I love that. So that's called projection. What was it? Yeah. Projective identification is where the patient or client right. unconsciously does and says things that are going to turn you into the fill in the blank, the abuser, the abandoner, the harasser, the, the degrader. Um, and so again, yeah. by monitoring your feeling or, or the sex, you know, so let's say someone has been sexualized, you know, they grew up and they were very sexualized or sexually abused. They could turn you into the sexual perpetrator. And all of a sudden you find yourself as a therapist starting to have all these really powerful sexual thoughts towards them. And like, and just, and you, and you think, what is this? And any of one of the things that can come up, you can question like, Oh, this is a person who was sexualized starting at age seven and had was, had all these adults sexually abuse him or her. And is it, it's very possible that through projective identification, they are turning me into the sexual abuser. They're trying mm -hmm. to get me to sexualize them because that's what's happened. That's the dynamic that's played out over and over and over. It's so fascinating. Just hearing you talk about that was like me taking five shots of espresso and just like <laughs> lit me up. I had this, it's, it might be a little bit slightly different than like mirror work or this down Unload that came through for me a year ago of external family systems as opposed to internal family mm -hmm. systems, but it's kind of like combining mirror work and projection identification to be like, okay, if that's coming up in you, where is that in me? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like our internal parts that are physically being manifested when we're working with someone else. And I, I definitely notice that as well and relate to that. All right. So I know this has been a lot going a lot of different ways, probably didn't talk about nearly what we thought we were going to talk about, but just to close the loop. So we talked about the two bipolar types, but just to go high level with a few more of the top eight uh, classic diagnosis when we can summarize them, let's just dive into those and then kind of like what the options are for someone that has one of those diagnosis in terms of sitting with psychedelic therapy. Yeah. yeah. So just to kind of flash out my list, uh, one of those diagnostic categories is schizophrenia. Like that is clearly a thing. Now, schizophrenia has different etiologies. It, there's different types. I mean, surely when we say schizophrenia, we're, we're talking, it's a big tent. There's a lot of different clinical presentations and genetic etiologies and, and environmental um you know, aberrations or triggers that go into that. But there is something called schizophrenia. We see it in schizophrenia. I mean, in psychiatry, we know what it is. It has a, um, a whole course and a way it presents and it has a, a whole way of treating it. So I think th that is um, that is a thing. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is clearly a thing. It's, again, it's very genetic. It um, it's very identifiable, it, but again, like schizophrenia, it has tendrils that connect to a lot of things. So kind of in the OCD tent, if you will, it, you know, includes things like body dysmorphia and trichotillomania and hoarding and, um, possibly anorexia. Anorexia may actually be in its own category. That That's a whole, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> Um, and then, and then in a whole other category is what I would call, um, neurotic depression mm -hmm. and, and neurotic, we're using the, the kind of the, the psychoanalytical analytic word, meaning the opposite of resilience. So there's resilient people, they are dandelions. There's people that are much more orchidy. Those are, those are um, neurotic people. So there's neurotic depression. That's kind of an anxious depression. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a whole category with trauma and you know we talk about ptsd complex ptsd blah, blah, blah. but really there's a whole you know maybe one of these eight diagnoses is that there's this, again it's a big complicated tent but is all the manifestations of trauma the dissociative stuff the hyper arousal 
the the trust damage and then the depression that comes out the anxiety that comes out of it, the cognitive you know all the things but but really it's just all under this one thing trauma um and <clears throat> excuse me i think we have a category for sort of uh neurodevelopmental disorders which would be and again this is this would have some subtypes like autistic spectrum and and um a number of developmental disabilities but but it actually would be i think be a, a much much shorter list than we see in the dsm um oh you know and i even would put add under that <laughs> i don't think that that's a whole other podcast like what is add and is it is it a bona fide you know quote unquote real diagnostic category do um, we all have add at this point like that's an honest <laughs> question <laughs> Yeah, well, stimulant prescriptions went way up during COVID. And it's one of the reasons that it's so hard to get your Adderall or Vyvanse right now is because whatever, like 30, 40 million more, 40 million more Americans during COVID, woo, mysteriously, magically had ADD and got on ADD meds. So yeah, but, but I mean, I, I mean it like seriously, I remember the Microsoft study that came out in like 2013 or 15. Uh, when it came out, I remember I was at a business conference and they were saying that our attention span is shorter than a goldfish, which I forget if it's seven or 11 seconds, whatever it is, but it's only gotten worse since then. Like, doesn't that not just taking that specific fact, but like, we all know that we don't have long attention spans and we're scrolling endlessly for what if to feed the hungry ghost like don't most of us have add at this point i think you're right i think if you live in america with an uh, with a smartphone you probably have some acquired add i mean i i love to read and i have to say i find it increasingly hard to sit down and read a book yeah. I, and and I, again, I, and I just feel like, oh my gosh, I, I should go do this or I should check that or, you know, oh, did I get an email? <laughs> like, what is wrong with me? But I think what's wrong, like, we're just so bombarded with dopamine um, triggering inputs that, yeah, it's, it's increasingly hard for us to just sit down and read a book, which, you know, most of us should be able to do. And if anyone's ever had like even just like a low dose of psilocybin recreational use or Wachuma San Pedro is a great medicine for this as well. I mean, all medicines really, but I'm thinking the ones that are more ceremonial or maybe not even ceremonial, but your eyes are open. You know, you just you become so still and you can just be so in the present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, okay, cool. Just want to entertain that. So we, we got an idea of these different diagnoses. Um, how do we go about psych psychedelic therapy knowing mm -hmm. that you might have one of these? Like, what are the safe guidelines? Yeah. So more and more, I'm thinking, you know, in the psychedelic realm, realm, that the ketamine is, for many people, is the best starting material. Now, there's a lot of debate, is ketamine a psychedelic or not? Well, if you, if you look at, the, again, the word psychedelic, as you were discussing earlier, psychedelic means mind manifesting. And I don't know. If you've tried ketamine, like intramuscular IV ketamine, and you think that's not psychedelic, then I'd, I would question you, what do you think psychedelic is? <laughs> my mind is like about the most psychedelic thing you could possibly imagine. But, um, you know, for a, I used to think that, oh, I can't wait till we get MDMA online and psilocybin, the other options. So ketamine is probably going to fade in the background. We're not going to need that. But, you know, there were a lot of significant medication interactions with with some of the classic psychedelics and MDMA, and they can make depression worse. They can make you psychiatrically worse. And I've seen that with all those. Ketamine rarely makes people worse. When used properly, mindfully, it may not help, but but particularly for the mood disorders, bi bipolar one, for the, you know, the bipolar spectrum and endogenous kind of hypersomnic mood disorders. There's nothing like ketamine. I mean, it is a complete game changer. And to the degree that, you know, I've been using ketamine extensively in my practice for seven years. And I I sometimes ask myself, how did I even practice psychiatry before ketamine? Like I mm. and I think the answer was used way more medication, a lot more dangerous medication, and way more people were in the hospital and way more of my patients were miserable way more of the time. Um I think when you move into the realms, though, let's just talk trauma. You know, one could argue that the two 
great unspoken or uh, uh, not uh, so the two great unmet needs in psychiatry are trauma and the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. But let's leave, leave the schizophrenia thing aside. You know, psychiatry does not have much to offer trauma. Our yeah. psychiatric meds barely work for trauma, if at all. But now with ketamine and MDMA and psilocybin and other things coming online, we actually have some really cool, powerful substances that can shift the needle. And again, there's lots of cool psychotherapies and psycho and um, somatic therapies for trauma, but those tend to be hard and grueling and expensive because you have to do them for so long. And you know, one of the things I think we're finding with some of the psychedelics is they can speed up that process and get people feeling better faster. So with trauma, um, I think you can make a really strong case for ketamine being first line and maybe psilocybin second line, sure. and then uh, maybe MDMA third line. And when you look at the psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, it, the psychedelics are really con contraindicated. You know, in all the OC, right, you know, yeah. one of my psych psychiatric diagno uh, diagnostic categories was OCD. Psilocybin is some really cool emerging data with the OCD and its related illnesses. Ketamine doesn't touch those at all, and MDMA doesn't touch those. 5-MeO2, so, just not oh, data, but just mm. from like uh, experience from people I know, uh, mm. that's a good one too. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm I'm guessing at least into the foreseeable future in terms of treating mood disorders like severe depression and treatment resistant bipolar like ketamine is going to be front and center and i don't see anything replacing that anytime soon it's just it's such a game changer treatment for so many people but with trauma and ocd spectrum stuff i think there's a lot of cool options and thank goodness because boy there's so many people suffering so terribly from trauma and particularly people who spend so much time in dissociation, I think we have some pretty good treatments for people who live with the hot symptoms of trauma, the hyperarousal, flashbacks, and panic. And we have a lot of stuff that's helpful for that. But if you live in the dissociative freeze, the dissociative numbing, up until recently, we've had very little to offer those folks. And, and that's millions and millions and millions of people who spend, who spend much to if not most of their life in dissociative freeze. Right. Yeah. And what's fascinating to me, the part that I think, at least for me, is a little bit unclear. So I imagine at least for some people listening, it might be a little unclear is with bipolar one, there's like the psychiatric uh, psychosis portion, but then there's the other like uh, category of just like psychosis. Right. Mm -hmm. So how, because if I'm hearing you correct, like ketamine would work well for someone with bipolar one, but then with the psychosis piece of it, like that separate category, mm -hmm. it wouldn't work well for them or yeah. it would. It, yeah. So um, if you have a mood disorder, and again, this, and another way to think about it, Mood disorders are really sleep disorders. So if you look at anybody who's got some flavor of clinical depression, they have major sleep problems. Like if you're quote unquote depressed and you're sleeping fine, you're not depressed. I mean, you might be distressed or demoralized or sad or bombed, but you don't have clinical. It's like you have to. So you can think of mood disorders as sleep disorders in, in, to some degree. Um, and ketamine is an incredibly powerful treatment for the depressed phase of mood disorders. Mood disorders can get so severe, like bipolar one, that they can tip into psychosis, like a psychotic depression, a psychotic mania. We don't really understand the mechanism of that, but it, it is true. If you take depression and crank it up all the way, it gets psychotic. You take mania and crank it up all the way, it gets psychotic. But that's not a contraindication necessarily for psychedelics or ketamine because it's still a mood disorder. It's a sleep disorder. It's not a psychotic disorder. It's a mood disorder that's so severe, it started to have a psychotic flavor. But if you start with psychosis, like with schizophrenia, so the, the core deficits of schizophrenia are, well, there's a bunch of them, but one of them is psychotic rea reality testing. If you have what we call a primary psychotic disorder, the psycho psychedelics are largely contraindicated because they can worsen that. So if somebody comes in my office and they've had psychotic symptoms in the past. Um, I'm always deeply wanting to know, did that come out of a mood slash sleep disorder 
or do they have what we call primary psychotic disorder like schizophrenia or or another kind of primary psychotic disorder or is a substance to do psychotic disorder then does it matter where they're at now versus previous and do you do your own diagnosis as opposed to what they come in telling you that they were no. told previous no i no psychiatric diagnosis is such a complete mess i always want to no i always want to know i always ask people like do you have what's your understanding of your psychiatric diagnosis that, that's something i'd ask in the evaluation then i ask people like do you buy that like, can you, do you resonate with that? Yeah. What do you understand? You know, and sometimes people will say, yeah, I have bipolar one and yeah, totally. Yeah. I read on quiet mind. I've had two terrible bouts of psychotic mania. I was hospitalized. Oh yeah. I, you know, other times people are like, well, they tell me this, but I think it's bullshit. I'm like, oh, okay. So no, every, you know, everybody, a lot of people come in with diagnoses or this big list, but to me, it's like, hmm, purported or supposed or possible. Um, and again, so so many psychiatric diagnoses are, are just subsets of other diagnoses. It's if you're thinking parsimoniously, conservatively, you're trying to find like, are there one or two or maybe three things that can explain all this versus this huge list of, oh, you've got these right, 18 right. DSM diagnoses, you know. Man, I could keep going with you. It's been so much longer. Craig, I really, 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 truly appreciate your time and your wisdom and you sharing so openly and you going with the flow on this podcast. I, I have so many more questions. And I think like the part that is the cliffhanger on this one is like the wild west of uh, psychedelics right now, because it is so crucial and important that we find some facilitators such as yourself that are really getting in there with their patients and not just taking these diagnoses at face value, because it is it's alarming to me um, for a lot of reasons. And one of them is something that I don't think gets talked about a lot. But if someone is, you know, identifying with, say, schizophrenia, and they're like, nope, 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 nope can't you know, do psychedelic therapy, I can't do it. It's like, well, maybe you can, maybe it's a quote, unquote, misdiagnosis diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. I think what we talk about and focus on a lot is just facilitate. And this still is a subset that doesn't get talked about a lot. But the, when this subject gets talked about, it's more common, at least from what I hear is facilitators being out of integrity and being like, Oh, you got that, whatever, we're just going to do this anyways. And then they have a psychotic break, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of spiritually bypassing all is perfect. And you know, that's the setup for them for what's coming next, right? So there's so much more here to discuss, but um, on your end, are there any closing thoughts before we close this podcast? Now, this has been fun. It's been a wide ranging discussion. I feel like we, we covered a lot of things like 20%. And I think we could have gone on for a lot longer. Um, no, I, I really enjoyed talking. I'm really, I'm glad that you wanted to hear a little bit more about sort of how I think ther about therapy in the clinical moment, because I've actually been thinking about that a lot. And really trying to think about ways how to model and teach people to work in the here and now and, and bring therapy, like bring it alive in the room and recognize that whatever people are talking about, womp, 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 like it's going to come in the room and that's, that's the money. Like that's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that's where a lot of us, I'm a psychedelic integration guy. And I feel like that's a lot of us where we play, but um, it's cool to see like that coming, like the, you know, merging of fields or whatever you want to call it anyways though open invitation to come back on the soul seeker podcast this has been so much fun if you ever well, want you. to talk about different ones guys check out craig's podcast back from the abyss you can just go to the show notes and go to his website his podcast right there craig thank you so much for coming on the pod yeah it's really fun thanks Sam.